Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show for Thursday, November 14th, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Show notes will be over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash 33. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have a new HIV strain, a new youth use for anthrax, and new ways to spend money. But first... The nation's largest milk producer owns 58 brands. Names like Dairy Pure Milk, True Moo Chocolate Milk, Land O'Lakes Butter, and Friendly's Ice Cream. And while it says it plans to continue operations for now, today's bankruptcy is the culmination of a series of moves that have rocked the dairy industry. I regret to notify you we must cease purchasing milk from your dairy farm. This small farm outside Louisville, Kentucky, closed this summer after Dean stopped buying its milk. The reason? U.S. milk consumption has been in a steady decline, down 26% over the past two decades. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty steady decline. And all those milk alternatives. <laughs> oh, yeah. And prices are lower now than they were 10 years ago. Dean combined several of its regional brands and launched the first national milk brand, Dairy Pure. But the growing interest in plant-based beverages like soy, almond, and oat milk has continued to eat into sales. And there's competition from the world's biggest retailer. Walmart began processing its own milk two years ago, prompting Dean to cancel more than 100 contracts with dairy farmers across eight states. And then grocery chain Food Lion cut ties with Dean last year. Damn. Wow. Bad news. Yeah. It's funny. I found some vegan YouTube channel where they're uh-huh. happy about it. Yeah, we're winning. It was hilarious. All the comments were, yeah, drink your hemp milk. <laughs> kind of funny. It is pretty funny. We ourselves, we are actually pretty light on dairy. We convert yeah. our milk over to kefir. Yeah. Which is actually a non-dairy beverage, but we do use whole milk for that. And we drink hemp milk, lots of it, and oat milk. Yeah, we do love our oat milk. Yep. K-13 Fox, mold problems close some Seattle children's operating rooms again. Just a few months ago, Seattle Children's says they discovered the mold during routine air tests yesterday. Today, they tell us three operating rooms are closed and they plan to close all of the operating rooms at some point this week. It's the same fungus that shut down all of the hospital's operating rooms about six months ago, like Jamie just mentioned. Since 2018, five patients have gotten sick from mold at Seattle Children's. A sixth child died this year from the exposure. And now the hospital is investigating two new potential infections related to this case of mold. Now, the mold plaguing the hospital is called aspergillus, according to the CDC. Typically, people can breathe it in without getting sick. But people with weakened immune systems, like the surgical patients at Seattle Children's, they're more at risk. Six months ago, when the hospital shut down all of its operating rooms, Seattle Children's said gaps in the air filtration system is what caused those air quality problems. Now, the hospital has not said what has caused it this time around aspergillus oh man that's always scary yeah Yeah. not good no microsoft ai working to help eradicate preventable blindness so i'm here in india and i'm going to see how microsoft ai is helping prevent people from going blind 80 percent of the people who went blind uh, can be prevented, but we have about one doctor to 70,000 people. You can't bring all of them to the doctor, so we take the technology to them. So how does Microsoft AI help you in your mission? The first step is to capture a photograph of the eye, and the AI does an analysis of the photograph without a physical doctor yeah. at the site. So AI can say, okay, this person doesn't have a problem, and this person does. That's correct so that they can get treatment. Very interesting. That is pretty cool. Probably verified with human eyes. I'm assuming as far as a yeah. second check or something <laughs> because you don't can't trust AI. But Yeah. That's really cool. Well, I I think they mentioned that that if they identify them then they yeah. could see an actual doctor. So pretty cool. <laughs> I like that use of AI better than facial yes, recognition. Yes. Actually and self-driving cars is actually yeah. helping people. Air, that this yeah. is good. <laughs> Unlike the selfish uses for AI that everyone else comes up with. Yeah. <laughs> Democracy Now! Google Project Nightingale. The Health and Human Services Department has opened a federal inquiry into Google's Project Nightingale program, which seeks to collect health data on millions of Americans. Project Nightingale. What? Wait, is what? A- well, yeah, what? Can- 
Can we just hear that one more time? What would you like to hear? Mm -hmm. Uh, The uh, health data (laughs) on millions. Program, which seeks to collect health data on millions of Americans. Oh my God! Project Nightingale is a collaboration between Google and Ascension, the second largest healthcare provider in the United States. Wait, second largest healthcare provider in the United States? Didn't we Mm -hmm. talk about how Google was also buying Fitbit? Yeah. Oh boy, yeah, this yeah. is very. Oh yeah, Google's oh. getting involved in everything. That's, this is very a video worrisome. Posted online, a whistleblower who works with the program says the cache of medical data includes the full names and medical details of millions of Americans. What happened to privacy? Well, this it's all HIPAA compliance stuff. What this uh. is, and this is the way it's being spun. I can play a devil's advocate here. If this wasn't Google and this was another cloud service. You know, like, so let's say, I don't know, Cloud Strike or Cloud Flare or whatever. Not Cloud Strike, Cloud Flare or whatever. Later, you know, any, yeah. or Google S3 or something. People wouldn't be freaking out so much. But since it's Google, well, it but just, I'm also freaking out too. So I well, understand why people are freaking it, out. It's also it's Google. the timing because they yeah. did just buy Fitbit. And now they're buying all but this other cloud, data. It's like a cloud service provider thing. Everyone's going to cloud <sighs> services. Everyone's going to Microsoft yeah. Outlook 365. Everyone's going to these clouds. So they're just another cloud service. But now... Uh, I always want to know holding who your else, medical data. Who else has that information, though? Well, and what are they doing with it? More specifically, insurance companies mm-hmm. and who who can buy, who can have access to this? Yeah. Is it secure? And well, well we always point it's out, never not, secure. yeah, it's never secure. So <laughs> never secure. <laughs> CBS News: Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba rakes in billions in singles day sales. <laughs> Sales in China shot through the roof when the clock struck midnight Monday. Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba raked in $1 billion in just over one minute of trading. What? Yes. It's a lot of money. Oh, my. Very fast. One billion in a minute? Yep. Oh, yeah. In Shanghai, Taylor Swift helped to kick off the online shopping Uh, event. What? Taylor Swift. How much is she getting Probably the biggest performer right now. Yeah. Possibly. The company founded... Alibaba and its rival JD.com reported nearly $60 billion in sales only partway through the 24-hour retail bonanza. We have done a pretty good job in terms of upgrading the live streaming functions with more interactive features. So this is just fun. A group of Chinese university students created Singles Day in the 90s as a sort of anti-Valentine's Day for people. It was just created... Yeah, 11 what? years ago. Right? Oh, my. And it's yeah. already turned into yeah. a commercialism nightmare. Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Without partners. Alibaba adopted it a decade ago as a marketing tool, and it quickly evolved into <laughs> the world's largest online shopping spree. Robots worked wow. around the clock as orders came streaming what? in. The spending blitz is a temporary boost to retailers since the U.S. trade war has Chinese consumers tightening their belt. Wow. Very crazy and we americans think black friday yeah so it's hard to get real numbers on this what were the numbers they say said 35 billion that report said 60 billion too for some reason i don't know what the numbers actually are oh man but according to adobe analytics and analytics the post thanksgiving shopping weekend is expected to bring in 29 billion in online sales this year so oh that's us. Gosh. In 2018, Black Friday and Cyber Monday reached record highs of 6.2 and 7.9 billion in online sales. So, so we're not... We're not as powerful as the Chinese market? No. Is what you're telling me? Absolutely not. It's oh. hyper-commercialized. So, yeah, uh, Taylor Swift singing. Here in yeah. America for Black Friday, all we get is people trampling each other on, <laughs> I know. at Walmart. Yeah. We don't get Taylor Swift? That's true. We just get the Macy's parade, I guess. But. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I was going to say... A lot too, of money. Well, who are those advertisers? advertisers beholden to then mm. it's not gonna be us anymore <laughs> maybe well it's whoever has the power well it looks like china right now has all they have the people the commercial power so yeah. they have the power right now for yep. buying they do <laughs> nbc nightly news apple car discrimination allegations apple calls it simple and secure a credit card created by apple not a bank But Apple and partner Goldman Sachs are now accused of gender bias. Software developer and millionaire David Heinemeyer Hansen says he and his wife share assets and income. But Apple Card gave him a credit line 20 times higher than hers, even though she has a higher credit score. That sounds sexist. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> that sounds more bad. more proof all this credit score stuff is bull. Yep. She has a higher credit score? Too? Yeah. Wow. Shared assets and she has a higher credit. St- Oof. You know, she's a woman. That's the score, though. That's the score we're supposed to all care about. <laughs> it seemed very discriminatory that I would get 20 times the credit limit, even though our stats were the same. Goldman says a computer algorithm made the decision. An algo. It was yeah, the algo's fault. It's an fault. algo's fault. Right. I love how it's an Apple computer being used. Yeah. Who programmed the algo? Yeah. ...invented on Twitter, social media erupted with similar stories. Even the man who co-founded Apple, what? Steve Wozniak, says he got 10 times the credit limit that his wife Janet got. It was so low I could barely buy a phone or a plane ticket, and I buy all of his plane tickets. I always think in terms of assets and income, and it's the same for both of us, and that should determine your credit worthiness. Goldman Sachs, Apple's financial partner, says gender and marital status are not factored. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> we have evidence to the contrary. <laughs> we look at an individual's income and an individual's credit worthiness, which includes factors like personal credit scores, how much debt you have, and how that debt has been managed. Consumer advocates say algorithm bias is nothing new. We've seen it in housing. We've seen it in hiring. We've seen it in health care. Tonight, the Wozniaks say Goldman Sachs has offered to increase Janet's limit as New York State regulators <laughs> look into whether this credit card algorithm has an illegal gender bias. Wow. Very interesting. The co-founder of Apple coming out. That is, that is very pretty, bizarre. And it's the Apple funny. card. Wow. Man, all this credit stuff is it's, just all. Yeah. And it's odd, though, because we're now fighting over who can get themselves into more I debt. I know. That, that was... <laughs> It's I. It, it's really weird. Yeah, it's, it's who can dig themselves into a deeper hole. It's kind of funny that. They, yeah. Well, you know, they raised her credit limit, but that doesn't solve yeah. any of the actual issues. Well, how do you determine how much debt people should take? And, yeah. Uh, and a quick follow up on the homeless ish uh, situation going on in Austin, Texas, right now. What went on? The governor came in and said, "Hey, city, if you don't." do something i'm going to come in and the state did after clearing people out from austin underpasses earlier this week the state of texas today cleared out a place for them to go today governor greg abbott announced that state-owned land along 183 near montopolis is now available it can be used as a temporary shelter until a larger 300 bed shelter can be built by the austin business community so now i have a report from kvue People began moving into new homeless camping area. It's like perfect. And then we got here. It wasn't anyone here but two guys. Michael Johnson and his friend Jose rode 13 miles on their bikes to find a safer place to call home. Wow, we don't have to talk to anyone to be here or, you know, sign up. The state designated this area off of 183 near Montopolis as a temporary homeless camp equipped with portable restrooms and hand washing stations. We thought like, wow, we got bikes that can handle the terrain as long as it's not on the freeway we should be able to get there. But there are questions about how other homeless will be able to get to this camp several miles from downtown. Cap Metro said Friday they will get the homeless to the campsite, but they are waiting for more guidance from the state on how exactly they can help. But for Michael and Jose, we want to kind of let people know like where it says all of this with the graffiti, if you can see it, (laughs) like this is where I want to be. They are in good spirits now that they're... Hey, at least he Dave. claimed his spot earlier. Yeah, it's, he's, he's good spirits. That's important. They're yeah. Here. The only thing I was really concerned with is like, will it be electricity if we're way out here? So we just said, okay, but we have a plan for that too. What's your plan? <laughs> Generators. They were able to what? talk to a DPS trooper about their concerns. The governor's office says troopers will be patrolling the area 24 hours a day. Do you think this is better than... On where you were before or staying under the underpass? Absolutely. 100%. Oh, well, that's well, good. Yeah. <laughs> At least there's something positive but there. It's temporary solutions. It's the state in the city. State of Texas, city of Austin. They are in a pissing match right yeah, now, it looks like. And that is... It sounds... It, it, very interesting. Well, you... Be, yeah, because if you look at the what the geopolitical and you know politics of this whole thing is the whole accusation is well it's all liberal cities these liberal policies 
And if you think about it, well, where are the a lot of homeless in Southern yeah. California, San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, par- apparently. Yeah, Portland, Seattle. Seattle, Washington, Austin, Texas. These are these yeah. are liberal cities. There's no yeah. denying that. Now, and, I'm we're not saying that necessarily that's we need to look at these policies and figure out what's going on because there's obviously what are the common denominator? What is going on? Good weather, probably. Yeah. Good support, social yeah. services. Austin does I hear it's getting really cold in Austin and Seattle is really freezing. When I was in Seattle in January, it was really cold. Well, that's why then we have to go to SoCal. Yeah, Southern Cal- California seems to be the spot. But yeah. I don't understand what's it it's baffling. Yeah. It's just, and it, it is no long term answer to homelessness, unfortunately. No. The we talked about mobile loaves and fishes, their community first village. If you do a Google search for that, we talked about that. That that's also in Austin, Texas. It's a community nonprofit that takes no government money and they just put up these little tiny houses on this big piece of land and they have a community working they brought a bunch of homeless together formed a community and now they're not homeless so it's actually kind of offensive yeah. to say they're homeless although all the media reports call them homeless <laughs> even though i'm not homeless i have a yeah, job and a house <laughs> i'm yeah. not homeless <laughs> but that's what's super cool about that community is it gave them a sense of purpose mm-hmm. and and they get they have jobs like yeah. they, they they go out and work because they all want jobs. They want to work. It's just, you got to yeah. have a place to live. got to have some kind of community, some kind of structures. And yeah, I think the key word is community, the community. there that you said. Yep. To give you that purpose. Yep. We'll keep watching this report. <laughs> yep. Purdue Research Park, anthrax against bladder cancer. There are two kinds of bladder cancer, uh, invasive and non-invasive. The invasive is the more severe, of course, and it requires the... Uh, pretty much in all the cases, the uh, surgical removal of the bladder. So that leads to a lower quality of life and less survival. Um, The non-invasive is treated with a series of approaches nowadays, but none of them are extremely effective, which leads to a high rate of recurrence. So therefore the patient needs to return over and over, so that makes it one of the more expensive cancers that there is. In addition, the patients do develop certain sensitivity to the treatment, and that makes actually sometimes intolerable the treatment, and they need to stop the treatment. One of the first challenges was that the better, more efficient therapeutic agents were required, and this is what our agent is, 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 is very efficient able to eliminate all cancer cells in the laboratory settings and in vivo is able in one shot to eliminate about 20 percent of the total tumor mass in one application in, in spontaneous bladder cancer so in addition to that it's very fast so we are comparing treatments that last two hours nowadays so the patient need to hold on the, the on the on the bladder field with with the therapeutic for two hours and this compound is effective in minutes. So we're talking about in laboratory, two minutes. In, in the practice, we do about 20 minutes of installation. So it's a significant change. Those two characteristics, high, highly efficient and fast, is going to make this uh, approach uh, transformative in the treatment of bladder cancer. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering what happened to anthrax. Now it's back in the news. <laughs> something good so yeah ready to move on yep how you say that is it abbott 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 discovery of new strain of hiv we are actually looking for the next pandemic that is really what we're trying to do and we're also looking for the weird viruses that may cause diagnostic tests not to work anymore all of the viruses that we study really are a plane right away it's always possible it's always to a plane. have yeah, it's always a plane ride. Why not a <laughs> cruise ship? <laughs> no cruise ships can get pretty oh, nasty yeah. too. <laughs> migration of viruses whenever there's migration of people. The Stop migration. <laughs> I'm joking. Stop I viruses. Mean... <laughs> program really is a collaborative scientific effort. We work with partners from around the globe. To date, we've worked in 45 countries on six continents. We have an enormous repository of samples that we've collected over the past 25 years. To date, we're up to over 78,000 samples in our program. Holy crap. Yeah, that's impressive. That's a lot of (laughs) 70, woo. Abbott's tests are used to screen more than 60% of the world's blood supply. We take that responsibility very seriously to make sure that our tests can detect every type of HIV and hepatitis.
hepatitis that could be in those samples. Abbott is announcing the discovery of a new strain of HIV called subtype L. It's one of the strains that's part of the global pandemic of HIV that is found all around the world. Discovering this new strain of HIV is really just the first step. We've confirmed that it exists, and we've shared the sequence with the greater research community. And that will allow everyone to be able to evaluate how it might impact diagnostic testing, treatments, and potential vaccines. The ability to discover new viruses that could be significant from a global public health perspective, that's extremely rewarding and fulfilling. The discovery of this new strain of HIV reminds us of why the work we do is so important at Abbott. If we can actually prevent even one infection with HIV or hepatitis, then we've done our job. Press release. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. Plus, that's why she's excited. <laughs> and you discovering probably a little oh, bit yeah. of money. Oh, yeah. But, I'd be excited, too. But that. it's also, it's evolution in action yeah. right there. Oh, yeah. strains. Tracking that's it, what happens. That's cool. Yeah. That's, that must be a cool lab. And CNN, Dr. Sanjay Gupta explains everything to us. It's interesting because they were able to find this, but this particular uh, uh, subtype now is part of a larger group of, of HIV viruses. I'll show you this, this uh, graphic quickly here. You know, people think of HIV as one disease. It's actually several groups and then several uh, types, and now a additional subtype up in the upper left, uh, right corner there. That's the L subtype. But it's tested. The, the current testing will find it, so it's not a threat in that way and the current treatment will treat it. Oh, is that right? So yeah. the preventative drugs that are on the market right now do treat this new... The, you know what the... That's good. Yeah. <laughs> if that's what Although, we're, we're all waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're waiting to see if the drug companies need to make more stuff and... Well, preventative you know, drugs specifically, what those are doing is trying to decrease the risk of transmission, okay? So uh, someone who, who, who does, you know, is not HIV positive does not become HIV positive. Those have been very effective and, you know, I think a significant effort in, in terms of curbing AIDS. In fact, if you take a look at the numbers specifically with regard to, to PrEP drugs, as they're called, uh, you're having, uh, I think, 500% more people are taking it. But look at what it does. It reduces by about 99% when taken daily the risk of someone getting HIV through sex. So it's a really good preventative. And there are vaccine trials that are going on around the world as well, which we're going to have some results on in the next few years. One of the most remarkable. Hell yeah. Pretty cool. Yep. Cool stuff. Anything to add? I think I'm good there. Cool. CBS This Morning Fraternity and Drinking Culture Question After Four Student Deaths in One Month. Washington State University is suspending all fraternity and sorority social events after the death of a student possibly tied to alcohol. This is the fourth fraternity-related death in the U.S. in the past month that has led to suspensions or crackdowns on fraternities. Just a few months Oops, ago, Seattle Children's that. Center... That was my bad. There you go. Sorry. I don't know. Actually, I want to look at this map. Nearly two decades. Ah, Washington ah, State, you ah, know, crackdowns on fraternities. There we go. Apple I, chihuahuas, what is going on? Oh, Washington State University the gun. in the... No, I sped up my mouse speed. Oh. Uh, I put up the full speed. So I want to look at this map really quick because I was actually curious. Looks pretty random, but... Yeah. Coastal? Pennsylvania? Coastal coast? is just where all the people are. Dude, yeah, that's so. true. That's true. More probability. Yeah, it's... It's always the coast. I'm just trying to identify because it's talking <laughs> about drinking culture. Where's oh, that's true. Yeah, it is. That's... Uh, is there a cultural problem? CBS This Morning? There is a cultural problem. Professor Hank Neuer has studied fraternity drinking trends for decades. When the deaths occur, it's often because uh, they not only uh, want to drink with the members, they want to outdrink them to, sh to show off. You start wondering if sending your freshmen to college is going to be a dangerous task and, and not something that you look forward to as a parent. So, okay, but he didn't say anything about yeah. them shoving alcohol down your child's throat or anything, correct? I'm just making sure. No, and I was, okay. well, he also didn't mention maybe parents should oh, teach yeah. their, well. <laughs> you know, to drink responsibly. Got 22 so seconds. They, okay. The Washington Fraternity's national organization offered condolences to Martinez's family. It says it's working with law enforcement and the university in their investigation now. Meanwhile, San Diego State has announced a task force to review behaviors and procedures at the school's Greek organizations. Anthony. Oh, some really alarming. Uh, 
task force. That is really alarming news for San Diego State. They're, they have a task force dedicated to examining it's, fraternity drinking. Okay, Isn't that a huge party school? Good job. Yeah, that's I actually know my yeah mm, somebody I know got kicked out, uh, kicked out of that school for partying a little too hard. Apparently they, the parties get disgusting down there. Oh, man. Disgusting. That's where you get that new strain of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Maybe. That's why you got to use a condom. Yep. All right. Uh, details of drinking deaths. CBS this morning. Medics arrived to find 19-year-old fraternity member Sam Martinez unresponsive. Police say a preliminary investigation indicated that his death could be alcohol-related. Martinez's death comes days after... Could be alcohol-related. 14 fraternities were suspended at San Diego State University. That followed the death of 19-year-old freshman Dylan Hernandez, who fell out of his bunk bed in his dorm room and hit his head late last week. He fell out of his bunk bed and hit his head. Several students say Hernandez had been drinking heavily at a fraternity party. But he fell out of his bunk bed and hit his head. In yeah, those October, bunk beds are dangerous. Yeah, though. I've almost fallen out of bunk beds. Bunk beds are dangerous. I almost I, broke my arm on a bunk bed once. Yeah, I definitely but, have fallen out of bed in college. I, I wasn't, absolutely. wasn't drunk, just sleepy and missed the steps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Penn State suspended the Kaifi fraternity as it investigates the death of a 17-year-old who was at an off-campus house allegedly occupied by frat members. That same month, Cornell University in New York decried a pattern of misconduct after the death of a student who earlier attended a fraternity event. Very strange. I, yeah. So what is the push? It's legislation because we've been covering this for a while these fraternity deaths and these parents are lobbying congress and really yeah that's what it sounds like sounds like mm -hmm. there's going to be a push for le that's what see this is my just, problem with college that it's becoming yes where are the parents where are the parents accountable you yeah know, or teach personal your kid responsibility. not to drink that much and yeah i it's i it's, you know i i sucks but you can't, if you regulate everything, what are we going to do? We're going to have, what, just a security guard arm yeah, assigned but, to every student? Well, that's what colleges, I think, are becoming because people want to make them liable and responsible for everything that happens on campus. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, students are going to be students and yeah. they're, they're going to need to, yeah. you know, explore their limits and yeah. you just have to teach them to be safe about it, of course. But mm -hmm. you also can't nanny them and baby them forever. Yeah. See, the push, the way I've always perceived the fraternity thing was like people were pressuring you to have sex with goats and, you know, you know, all that weird stuff. So, yeah, I'm never, fraternities aren't, they don't sound good, but also what's going to, what are you going to do regulating them out? Guess what? They're going to open up outside of campus. They're right. going to open up everywhere. It's, and then that's, that's they're going to create a black market of these yeah, things. And it's that's arguably more dangerous. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. So, <sighs> good decisions. But I have noticed this huge crackdown. I've been getting a ton of emails about that. On alcohol specifically? On alcohol and shutting down the fraternities. Mm, interesting. Of course, no one talks about the cocaine that they use. Yeah, <laughs> the cocaine or the Adderall. But, well, yeah, let's let's talk about Adderall that yeah, people well. use. But I don't think those are pushed by the fraternities. <laughs> oh, maybe. I don't know. The Coke is. We need We need some... Boots on the ground information. Yep. Ask a healthy talk show. Yep. Send us an email. Don't leave us a YouTube comment. Those don't work. Yeah. CBSN, how your paycheck may impact your heart health. Over the course of nearly two decades, researchers found that people whose income dropped by 50% or more were 17% more likely to have a fatal coronary heart disease, stroke, or heart attack. Crap. I can only think my income has definitely dropped by 50% or more. <laughs> Shit. Oh, my God. Changing careers to a podcaster? My damn. Crap. Uh, while those whose income went up by 50% were 14% less likely to have a cardiovascular event. Okay. <laughs> hey, at least, you know, you're, you're pretty low. But it can't, it only has to go up by 50%, and then you're back. You're no, good. Phew, good. It's all relative. Science, science.
Yeah. Dr. Tara Narula, cardiologist, what are some of the contributing factors? So we can't prove causally what the factors mm -hmm. are, but we can definitely make assumptions. And what's interesting about this is that we knew in the past that higher income was associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, but we didn't know what changes in income really did. Right. And so you were guessing before, and you were right with a lot of your guesses. So we think that maybe some of the drop in income causes people to maybe choose less healthy foods. Yeah. The stress may cause them to yeah, choose less Yeah, I was going to say stress. <laughs> Social behaviors like smoking or drinking, they may become depressed, and we know that depression. How can you afford to smoke if you're poor? Yeah, I know. The, who are these rich, poor people that we know? Uh, I was going, but that's not us. No, can't afford cigarettes, are expensive. Yeah. is linked with coronary artery disease. Mm. Um, all of these things, less uh, working out or exercise, maybe mm -hmm. they don't belong to a gym anymore, they've lost their health insurance. So there are a lot of factors that might play into why a loss of income could raise your risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, raise your risk for a lot of things just because of the stress related yeah. to loss of income. Oh, that is super stressful. Yep, one of the great things about cardiovascular disease. One of the great things about cardiovascular disease, and we try to educate people about all the time, is that 80% of it is preventable. And it's that is a good thing. <laughs> I, that's an interesting way to spin it, and I'm going to use it. All right. <laughs> one of the great things about cardiovascular disease, open it up with that. It's mm. preventable by lifestyle factors, things like eating a healthy diet, exercising, controlling your stress, yeah. making sure that <coughs> your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugar are all in line. Right. So there are a lot of things that people can do, but yes, some of them require actively making those healthier choices, yeah. which can be difficult when you have less income. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of things are difficult I, when you I have I was going to say, go, go back income. to that slide for a second. You know, we almost got it. We got the healthy diet. Mm -hmm. We walk around. Yeah. We definitely don't drink alcohol. Oh, we definitely. <laughs> I can't, I don't, I do not smoke tobacco for sure. I can yeah, say I do not smoke tobacco, yeah. but I do smoke other things for sure. Well. Uh, hopefully hey. that means tobacco. <laughs> I'm just saying, help us prevent cardiovascular disease by uh, uh, I have a, I have another clip. Oh, sorry. I was... <laughs> And you're, you're, another you're trying to lead yourself into something. Here. Oh my God! The first time I try to actually <laughs> lead looking. myself. See, see that clip right there. Oh, sorry. Play the clip oh, yeah. there. Okay. Let's What's go. the takeaway from healthcare professionals? Yeah. I mean, Good I think lead we in. have to do a better job screening for this as part of our intake with patients yeah. and really assessing what is somebody's socioeconomic background and how might that be playing into the decisions that they're making. Because if we understand that, then we can really better approach them in terms of how we're going to care for them. Mm -hmm. So I think really understanding that this is a big factor will make us better uh, able to really help them right. as physicians. Ask those questions. Right. Heavy. Back to privacy. Do we really want our doctors knowing that information about us? Because the, the following two minutes of this interview that I took out was about income inequality and how we need to, and how we need to basically lobby and we need to put more money into med, you know, medical services for oh, everyone and all oh. this, which okay, that, so you can tell where the conversation, but really do we want our doctors knowing all that about us? I don't want my doctor yeah. knowing how much I make. I, I want saying. my doctor thinking everybody, we're all the same. I don't want, yeah, they don't need to know that because then, they, then it creates a bias. That's very You're going to give me the shittier drug because yeah. you think I'm poor? Well, they're going to know, they're going to be looking at your information like, oh, this guy's on the, uh, yeah, he's on the poor plan. Yeah. We know. Give him yeah. those crappy drugs. <laughs> give him the crappy drug. Give him the crappy operation. Yeah. Uh, give him the Privacy the fresh is important. I mean, yeah, it's it is. important. But as you were saying, you could help our health yeah, help. <laughs> our <laughs> cardiovascular health. By going over to healthytalkshow.com slash support, your financial contribution will ensure we remain unbiased, commercial free, and apparently healthy. <laughs> yes. But in the short run, also help us pay for things like rent. Our show is value for value. If you found value in the show, please provide value back by visiting healthytalkshow.com slash support. Yes. Also, if you have Amazon Prime, we want that free Amazon money. Amazon Prime. Look it up. Google Twitch Prime. Look that up, everybody. A lot of people listen to this show that have Amazon Prime. You can give us free Amazon money. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs Amazon. Let's get all the Amazon <laughs> money for free. Let's do it. We record Healthy Talk Show live on Mondays and Thursdays, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 a.m. UTC or at healthytalkshow.com forward slash live. Our email, askhealthytalkshow.com. Call us, 509-878-3229. Leave us a voicemail. We listen to them. And healthytalkshow.com forward slash social for all of our social media links. 
Love and light. Love and light.